Welcome back to another episode of the Beyond the Sidelines podcast. This week, we'll be discussing Deontay Wilder's epic wardrobe fail, the AFL All-Stars, Man City's denim jackets, and the Titans losing to the Burley Bears. We will also be talking to Holly Furling uh, in, in the interview section and learning all about her career and her international pathways. Let's get into it. And welcome everyone. Joining me in the studio, Finn and Campbell boys. How are we this week? I'm better now, Gusman. Much better yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. After that intro. Yeah. Oh yeah. I um, mean, there weren't any like superlatives, or there wasn't any. You no, know, I kept. I kept the it marvelous shorted. Campbell Johnson and the uh, adequate no, Phineas I kept Morton. it uh, short and simple. Well, Got no, the job done. No, that's uh, that's all good. I'm raring to go for a. Hour of sports, so let's, let's rip in. Do oh, it. Yeah. I'm sure yeah, the listeners exactly. are too. So do what it. have we got first? Let's, uh, let's do it. Shia LaBeouf, let's get let's, him on. <laughs> sure. Please come on the show, mate. He would, I reckon. He it, would. He was basically my he- in holes. He was basically my holes hero. is a cracking film. <laughs> I think I had to watch that two or three <laughs> times. Oh my yeah. like, god! Throughout my scholastic <laughs> endeavors. <laughs> I think I had to watch Holes two or three times. Oh, yeah. more zero. You know, he was one of the characters. Yeah. Who names a kid? A Character zero. zero. <laughs> How about unit? <laughs> unit. <laughs> yeah. unit. Unit. Anyway, we could talk about holes all day. Yeah, welcome to the holes podcast. We, we should actually dedicate the holes cast. The holes. Oh, nice. Thank you. Anyway, I feel threatened because I think you're better than me. <laughs> I that mean, was, what's that, new, pal? That was pure genius. Yeah. Thank you, mate. That's great. You got a you got a talent, honestly. <laughs> anyway, we'll we'll get into our fast for radio. Five. That's for sure. We'll get in our fast five. No disagreements uh, here, CJ. <laughs> that's uh, five topics. Covered in five minutes. Uh, that's what we try to do. We ninety nine percent of the time we go over, but that's just because we love talking about sport. Hey, that is cricket. Um, now we'll get on to the first it's one. It's not cricket, now, Campbell. It's sport. He clearly <laughs> defined cr- that in the introduction. It's, it's cricket. just cricket. Pull now, your head and sound. Now, boys, boxers. Uh, they're used to a they're, sort of extravagant boxers, life. They're aren't quite they? handy when you're trying to move stuff. They are. Ah, that's funny. Anyway, Deontay Wilder definitely uh, dressed to impress uh, in his bout against uh, Tyson Fury, but apparently he uh, he blamed, or not blamed, but I think it contributed to his loss, he said, uh, excuses. That, his, like yeah, excuses. Excuses, that his uh, uh, uniform was weighing him down, his kit was weighing him down. Well, it had we have an to effect t- on his legs. Yeah, well, yeah. we have to talk about this kit specifically, Gusman. You forgot to mention Describe that. Describe it to me. It was basically a knight in shining armor, mm. CJ. No, he was... Coated in like football shoulder pads, like, like gems, American as well. football pads. Mm. Some like big mask helmet thing and a it, crown. It looked cool. Well, Tyson Fury was like the opposite. He came in as a king, you know, Gypsy King. Obviously, he came in on a sedan. Salve, guys, how are we doing? And it was, I think that was the opposite. He wasn't getting weighed down at all. He was getting carried, if anything. I loved it because he came out to some song. I don't know the name of it. It's mm. well beyond my years, but basically, the lyric was crazy, and he was singing along to it. Not mm. very boxer esque. CJ, no. he was just enjoying his time and enjoying his mosey to the ring. And ultimately, I mean, he got the job done, didn't he? Mm. I'm not sure if you guys watched it. You didn't because you're in no, Ikea. I, I, well, I was working. I mean, you working. What would what? you prefer to do? Go to Ikea for the uh, beautiful food or, mm. or watch a fight? I mean, I know where I'd prefer to be. Ikea. Ikea. It yeah. is amazing. That's why you're on a sports podcast. Yeah, exactly. You know, but Deontay Wilder, I will just say this quickly. He also blamed the loss on his trainer and a bad <sighs> leg. My God. Mm. Now, basically, because he was getting pummeled for seven rounds, and then one of his co-trainers threw in the towel. Mm. Now, apparently, mm. the other co-trainer didn't want him to do it. Mm. Controversial. It's just the contro- anyway. controversy. So it's mm. like Deontay Wilder, he's also said... Don't throw on the towel. I'm a warrior. I'll yeah. go down on my sword type thing. So it's TKO. Again, he got outplayed, but uh, it's mm. it going to be interesting to see what happens next in the world of boxing. Certainly if will. Tyson Fury decides to unify the belts against Anthony Joshua, or if it's a trilogy mm. against Deontay Wilder, which I think could be the go. Anyway, I think it could be on. Gusman, you hurry me up. So yeah, yeah, you were go. going on a bit of a rant there. Um, AFL All Stars. Uh, Campbell, this is your domain. You're the mm. AFL export. Uh, export expert. Export, export um, as well. Export. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Competition as a whole, who do you think will win? Um, oh, competition, that is a t- competition tough one match, one off. That's a tough one. one. I think year. the um, I think the All Stars might have it. I, agree, I think actually. the oh, wow, um, okay, yeah, I don't think the Vicks have got it, which is pains me to say. I don't think um, they've favoured the All Stars. No, I don't. Well, 
I'd put my money on him, but oh, um, okay. it's interesting will. seeing. Yeah, probably hold will. him up for that one. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's interesting seeing. You know, you got Toby Green playing in the same team as Marcus Bontempelli, and it's like a bit awkward. Yeah, yeah. So Toby Green, your best mate, basically. Of course, hate him. Yeah, we're so all much. We're all friends with Toby Green. He's an absolute <laughs> legend. No, but it's going to be really in- interesting to see. It will CJ, be not just for a one-off, but I hope. That this becomes an annual event. Yeah, I hope they choose a charity each That's year. the thing. Mm. I think a lot of codes, a lot of sports could, you know, there's issues every year mm. that they could go, let's support this charity. It doesn't mm. just have to be the bushfires every year. That reminds me of a pa- Carl Pilkington thing. <laughs> <laughs> go on. He said, like, the the way to end world hunger is you pick it. So we're going to, do- instead of donating to all these different causes, <laughs> just focus this year, <laughs> this year, the hungry people. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, it's the disabled. Is, <laughs> it's just the most Carl well, Pilkington thing. I mean, you thing. can see what's going through. He's like, forget about the rest. Just focus on one yeah. one issue at a time. <laughs> That's just how he works. <laughs> one issue at a time. Exactly. No, but it would work with <laughs> it would work with the AFL All Star yeah. game, and I hope it works with multiple yeah. codes. That's what the league should do instead of yeah. coughing up the money. Ah. Or they should cough it instead of filling their coffers. They need money, say. mate. Yeah. They do need money. It's mm. uh, revenue versus yeah. obviously what they're. What, spending. So I've got to fix the broken teeth, you know. Speaking about a club with a lot of money, Man City. Now, they rocked up in... Uh, <laughs> they rocked up in <laughs> denim jackets. I thought that was a good segue. What are you going No, with? it was. It's no. just, Man City, you're a joke, pal. Oh, okay. They are. It brings a big smile to my face. Dude, As I said it? in the intro last week, not the denim, but obviously everything else that's happening. Yeah. Not including their win over Real Madrid at the Bernabeu, because oh, that's, that's impressive. Right. I said they're a rich club. Yeah. 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 yeah anyway, well, they, they won't be. be. They won't mm. be very... <laughs> but yeah, CJ, this isn't... It's quite a common thing in mm. top flight football, but teams have... Travel kits, kits, suits, usually, suits, yeah. But mm. Manchester City for their trip to Madrid decided, hey, let's mix things up just a little bit. It's fashion week in Madrid at the <laughs> exactly. moment, exactly. Let's uh, see if we can get on the uh, runway, mm. yeah. and uh, yeah, de- double denim, it's Gusman. So mm. d- it's not jeans, a which style. is a great look, it, it's jeans oh. and a denim jacket. Oh, I think I should have come to the podcast in that. I think that's the first thing. Your, your 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 sort of parents tell you when you're gonna go out and dress up for something, mm. don't go double denim. It mm. just doesn't work. Well, I think the other way around. I think always go double denim. Oh, Obviously, I'm joking. Shocking. If I could, if I, I would. Could. You know, mm. I just don't have the means to do that, CJ. No, I do. I think I have jeans. <laughs> do, you, but do you not have a denim? jacket? I do have a denim jacket. Who are you, mate? As if you don't have a denim jacket. Yeah, I all the cool kids. All the cool kids from 2004 have a, a <laughs> denim <laughs> jacket with with their with their wallet with, with a chain connected with to their graffiti, waist with graffiti on flames the back on the back. Yeah. <laughs> See, Gusman, I wake up every morning drenched Frosted in tips. Yeah. I wake up every morning drenched in guilt because I know mm. that I don't have a denim jacket ha- no, hanging that's up. A shame. So that's if the, you can have all the things in the world, but mm. if you don't have a denim jacket, exactly. You're just so person. my birthday is in ten months. So I know what I'm getting you. Oh, right. I, I bags it first, pal. <laughs> All right, and the our topic number four, Titans. They were beaten by the Burley Bears. Now the Burley Bears were the champions of the Intra Super Cup, so they're not a terrible side. But this is not good for the Titans, the Gold Coast Titans. They are probably uh, well destined for the wooden spoon already. They are spooners. See, I feel kind of bad that I've wasted my laugh because yeah. I feel that it could be used <laughs> now. There Thank you, you CJ. Cole Pilkington, focus your laugh on one thing. <laughs> <laughs> you can only use it once. No, yeah. but basically the question I want to ask you, Gusman, yeah. can the Titans possibly avoid the 2020 NRL wooden spoon? I don't think they can. Why can they? Because something to keep in mind with this game, wasn't their B team? Wasn't their C team? They featured quite a lot of their A-listers. Yeah, the, at least half of the side were... First grade players, Jai Arrow. Mm. Yeah, I uh, don't know if Jai Arrow, but Jared Wallace was playing. Uh, even their import, uh, Callum Watkins, uh, really good center. Oh, actually, no, he's a terrible center. Um, Brian Kelly, really good players, but they just didn't show up. And the Burley, I reckon, maybe the Gold Coast Titans are thinking maybe we should field this Burley Bears side, and they might have a better it, shot. They don't <laughs> have a long way to go. They yeah. just go down the road. Exactly. They might. CJ. CJ, Promo mm. Rello. Mm. Come on, NRL. Live Come dangerously. Yeah, Let's yeah, go. Yeah. But I, I always think, think about that the other day. Like, Burley team. I'd rather go to Burley to watch a game. You know, go down yeah. to the pavilion. You yeah. know, go up there. Be a great space. But no, yeah. it's going to be interesting in the NRL season seeing who gets that wooden spoon because it's going to be a tense competition mm. between them and my beloved New Zealand Warriors, of course. So mm. let's oh, see I how think, that I think hotly was... contested... Saga. I think you're safe bolts. around 12th and 13th. That's usually your. I disagree. Spot. I reckon we're uh, we're dancing it this year. Oh, yeah. Well, okay. you had a great showing at the NRL Nine, so you'll continue that, I'm sure. Yeah. Now, this was a bit of a shock earlier in the week. 
uh, Australia, the women's side, losing their first World Cup match. They have rebounded beating Sri Lanka, but mm. the first one they lost against India. Is this a worrying side uh, sign for, for the side in this competition? What yeah. Do you, what do you think, I, think so. I I don't I actually don't think it's that worrying. Look, mm. they I mean, we talked about uh we talked about this with Holly. Uh you'll be able to hear it later, but uh they have actually lost the first game in their in their World Cup competitions quite a few times. I mean, 20, mm. 2014, they lost their first game. 2016, they lost their first game. So it's it good seems, omen. yeah, mm. it seems as though when they lose their first game, they tend to go on to win the competition. Mm. They did lose by 17 runs, which is not a lot, yeah, it's but not it's big. not. But in T20, it's... It wakes it wakes you up. So it India have given Australia a real kick up the bum and mm. they're going, okay, we need to focus. Um, they, I think Australia thought they could breeze through this competition. It's mm. on home soil. Um, and they, I don't think they thought any side would worry them, but no. India have gone, we're here to, we're here to play, mm. you know, uh, that they really tested them and they beat them. So yeah. did you see the double, um, bounce no ball? Yeah. That <laughs> I can't remember who got out on it, but that's they, just, that was that's, dreadful. That's just, unlo- that just brings you back to park cricket when someone's coming in to, to bowl and it mm. just molly grubbers on a, on a yeah. dead wicket or something. Hit, yeah, like, dead, ah. It was the dead wicket, yeah. I'm sure. And you know, did you see what Thailand did? They brought gifts to the West Indies in their oh, first cool. game and first appearance at the World Cup. It was really cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah. Very mm. bizarre that a rival what, team would do that for another team. Yeah. Way, isn't it? Like it was just before a World Cup match, maybe yeah. after the match. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Get the wise men, bring some frankincense, some myrrh, you know, all, the, all that <laughs> stuff. It's myrrh. It's a weird gift, isn't it? That's it is strange. Myrrh. Anyway. For a baby? What even is myrrh? Yeah. I don't know. It was like a perfume. Ah, fair play. Again, why does a baby need that? Like a, Tim's smelling good. I, I thought it was like a mineral. Chanel number five. <laughs> <laughs> Get a baby. Yeah, it's just utterly bizarre because, yeah, yeah, I don't think baby Jesus was too concerned about well, I mean, he was in a barn, wasn't he? So Yeah. Oh, well, that's true, actually. Anyway, mm. we'll get off baby Jesus and uh, well, talk about the interview that we had this week. <laughs> Great transition. Ho- yeah, Love exactly. It. Holly Furling, uh, probably one of the best guests we've had so far on the podcast, represented Australia, uh, women's cricket, represented Queensland, and currently playing for the Melbourne Stars in the mm. WBBL. Yeah. Uh, she was a great chat. What yeah. do you boys think about it? Yeah, she was great. And I mean, if you want to hear her chat more, go listen to her podcast, Girls and Glory. Yeah, you can exactly. find it on all your major streaming platforms, yeah. just like us, which mm. if you haven't listened to our stuff, go listen to it. Well, I'm doing an fo- early plug this week. First and foremost, just keep listening mm. yeah. and then listen to yeah. that one. Let's, yeah. let's get into it. We are joined this week by Western District's Queensland Fire and Melbourne Stars representative, Holly Ferling. How are you, Holly? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great. Now, your backstory is uh, its quite interesting. You're from uh, originally the agricultural town of Kingaroy, right? Um, what was that journey like coming from Kingaroy, uh, playing in these big cities, playing uh, international tests, stuff like that? So I was very lucky. I uh, played for the Australian women's cricket team when I was still in high school. So I was in grade 12 um, and I I had a couple of goals at the start of that year. I wanted to prove that you could do it being from a a rural area, still staying at a state school. And then I wanted to to see how well I could go with my OP as well. So I ended up with an OP too at the end of that year. And that was with... A Bit World a Cup. Flex. That's all right. That's fine. <laughs> blows, blows us out of the water. <laughs> yeah. That ended up with, yeah, World Cup and an Ashes series as well. But I 100% fell into cricket. I had a girl at Touch Football one day um, when I was playing in Kingaroy and she asked me to come trial for the South Burnett team, just the regional team. And um, I went home and I told mum and dad that's what I was going to do and had to call the PE teacher and everything. And um, from there, just made the South Bend team, the White Bay team, and then the state team within a couple months. So, hundred mm. percent fell into it. There is no way I would be here if it wasn't for her. Um, and then I, I grew up playing against the boys and the men. I was lucky I had my brother um, that I was playing alongside. Um, he was he was the best person to train with because he'd he'd push me along the way. Um, but I think for me, he also it, it kind of I guess broke down a few of those barriers as well with some of the boys. Um, and then, yeah, playing against the men, I, I loved doing that and I owe everything that I am today to them because they definitely taught me that if you bowl in the right areas, you take wickets <laughs> and if not, you get met. So, yeah. um, no, it was, it was awesome growing up in a, in a country town. I definitely wouldn't change it for a thing. Well, I mean, you took a hat trick off your first three balls playing against the men. What, what was that like as an experience? <laughs> I did. I um. I, I think so often you get on, on like you, you're on a hat trick. Um. Mm. I didn't even think about this one. And I think too the funny thing was I didn't even expect to bowl. It was my first men's 
game and mum and dad um, actually weren't there. They didn't think I was going to get a bowl that day. So (laughs) dad was working. I think mum had gone and done some grocery shopping and she had a lady come up to her in the shops and go, well, your daughter's taken three for. Um, (laughs) But I, one of the, one of the guys in the hat trick was actually the brother of um, a, a girl that I, I was friends with at school. And so she's thanked me ever since because she's been <laughs> able to have something to, to hold o- over yeah. him that whole time. But um, no, I think I had registration papers thrown in my face straight after that game. <laughs> the worst part was I think I finished. Hey, subs. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. I think I finished with four for eight and then we got washed out. And so we didn't even get the chance to actually even win the game. But uh, um, no, I was, I was signed up for the rest of the season. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. They got you in early. Uh, what is, uh, you mentioned that you played for Australia when you were 17 and you're still in high school. What would that be like for your headspace at that age? Um, I, I think the best thing for me was that I was quite naive to it. Mm. Um, and I'd only played, or not even, I, I played a few months for the Queensland team. So I mm. debuted in October 2012. And then by January 2013, I was playing in the Australian team. So um, I was just kind of, a, I guess, a deer in headlights a little bit. You're just kind of um, quite in awe and all of a sudden you're playing alongside people like Elise Perry that you've grown up looking at on the TV or yeah. um, in the limited marketing that was around the women's game. That's who you saw. And, um, yeah, I was definitely pinching myself initially, let alone actually then replacing her in the team because she was out injured. So yeah. um, I, I think for me... It's the beauty, I think, of when you debut is that there's no pressure, mm. um, and particularly when you debut young, is that you are just taking it for what it is. There's no expectation. You don't have that expectation of yourself either. Um, and so you're playing with freedom. And, and I think often that's why we see that people's first years are often their best years because they just roll on in they're yeah. authentically themselves and there's nothing else happening around it. You're almost oblivious to the outside pressures that, that sport can bring in. Yeah. Does that playing with freedom, does that go over time for some players, do you think? Does it go yeah, over do, time? Or will go, like, does oh, it disappear? Yeah, I, do people I think start to get a bit cagey? There's always the second year curse. Yeah. Um, second year syndrome. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, so, um, and, and I think within that too, and particularly the way the game has progressed technology-wise and everything is that I – already am starting to put together plans for players next season and particularly the newer players that that might have actually that you didn't know much about you're starting to already gain intel on them and and start to work out what works and what doesn't with them so um, I think that freedom can go Um, it's essential and it's something that I've started to to realize in my own game is that you've you've got to free up in order to bowl fast you can't force it or muscle it or or Mm. anything like that there's it's a freedom of movement and um Part of that is also trusting yourself, and it's and it's hard to do that sometimes because I feel like the older we get, the smarter we get, which is sometimes not a good thing. Yeah, so yeah. Um, you start to overanalyze the game when cricket's quite simple. Um, but at the same time, though, it's it's just the way that the game's evolving. Batters are getting better, so we've got to get better as bowlers. Yeah, one hundred percent. And how did you find that transition into the squad? The culture of the girls, I guess. How much did they embrace you, and how much of a benefit was that? Yeah, I think it was a lot of key players. Um, so Renee Farrell was one um, who, who was an incredible bowler for, for the Australian team. Alex Blackwell, another one that was always one as soon as there's a new player in the team, she's she's a right around them and, and really helping them out and, and making sure that, that they settle in really easily. Um, the other one was actually Sarah Elliott. Um, and she, my first test, she was playing and she had a nine-month-old. So she was kind of like wow. the, the leader in... Um, I, I guess some of, of that stuff at that point in time, we were still, um, rooming, like we, we were sharing rooms and stuff. So she had to apply for special consideration to be, um, I, I guess rooming with her husband so that he could look after, um, bub. And fair, then, enough. fair enough. Yeah, too. I mean, it was, yeah. it was absolutely incredible. Um, she'd be, yeah, in between breaks, she'd be, she'd have the pump out and everything and then pass off milk to dad and dad's <laughs> on the side with, um, you know, you have bub on the front bottle of milk in one hand and jug of pims in the other. So <laughs> <laughs> Perfect it was, balance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it, it was really awesome to see someone like that. And and I always used to call her mum because oh, she wow. was one of the older ones of the team. And um, I remember my second, I think it was my second test, we were playing at Perth. And um, I remember going to bed that night and if we, uh, we were batting, so we I think we'd bowled first um, and it was in the second inning. So we were, we were batting, we are in a bit of trouble Went right if I bat tomorrow, I'm out there when we win, or I'm out there when we lose. Mm. And um, 
she was out there batting with me and, and when I came to the crease, she was like, who else would you want to bat with than your mum? I'm like, <laughs> true, very true. So, um, no, there's there's I think some of those senior players were really crucial in, in I guess, making a, a kid feel really comfortable in that team. Yeah, and I guess how does that compare? I know it's a little bit off topic. Mm. Um, with Phoebe Litchfield, mm. she's getting a lot of press at the moment, a lot of hype. I guess how does that compare? She's obviously probably going to get into the team soon or in and around it. Mm. How do you, what would you, I guess, suggest to her from someone else who was playing quite young? It's a completely different ball game for her now mm. um, because when I was playing, we had a couple of games on TV and that was it. Now, those young kids coming through, it's they're thrown into the elite arena. And even when I was playing for the Australian team early doors, it was still very semi-professional. Now we train like we're professionals, but we're, the pay's still lagging behind. But um, I actually think it, it's even more crucial now that we... Uh, invest in well-being and, and in the mental space because I think the higher the pressure and particularly with with young kids as well quite often you're working out your own identity I remember when I was that age as well you mm. your friendship groups are very important to you um, you're still working out your own mm. self-esteem and self-worth and, mm. and all of that you're still working out who you are I was so, about to say you're trying to find out who you are yeah and then all of a sudden you're in the bright lights of of elite sport and for everyone else to judge your performance, mm. good or bad, um, it's it's a difficult thing to, to grow up with. So I'm, I'm really excited now that there's more that's being invested into that, um, into that space and into that off-field space. Um, but it's exciting to see someone like her coming through because she's probably that generation that is only going to do cricket. Yeah. Um, so it, to think how good someone like her will be in the next 10 years is it's actually frightening. Yeah. Well, I've been thinking about this recently because obviously um, there's been lots of talk about pay in women's sport and, you know, it's televised as it's professional. You guys train, you do everything as if you're professional, but the pay is not at that level. How much of an impact does that have on you as an athlete, um, other athletes in other sports, AFLW, that kind of thing? How much of an impact does that have and where does it need to go from here? It's an, it's an interesting point at the moment. We're almost at this knife edge where um, all the other sports are continuing to push ahead and that's the way that women's sports are going to roll is if cricket pushes ahead, netball's got to come with, soccer's got to go with as well. Mm. So as much as the sporting bodies see the, each other as competing, we don't. We, we mm. think it's awesome if, if someone's pay deal goes ahead. The thing that they've got to balance though is we've still got full-time workers playing cricket mm. and full-time workers doing all the other sports as well. So we've got a girl who works in emergency as a nurse. We've got a doctor in our team. We have a principal, uh, oh sorry, a deputy principal as well, who's also the captain. How? At what point are you telling them you have to put a profession that you've worked your backside off for 10 years to get mm. and now you can only do cricket or you've got to choose? Yeah. And I think that's where the balance will come is we do want to be professionals. We're already training the hours like we are. Um, but I think there's got to be a nice gradual approach where you're not just getting rid of all of those girls that have so many more years to give um, but are still pursuing their, their lives off the field. We've already seen the model of the way that the boys work and um, I guess the beauty that we've got doing it second is mm. that we have a better opportunity to do it better. Yeah. Um, so we, we don't necessarily want everyone to only do cricket or only do their sport we want to make sure that they're studying outside or they've got an external interest because we've found and every single elite player that that is performing knows that when they've got a balance of off field and, and on field they're their happiest when it's not this vicious vacuum of of what elite sport is where your friends are at, are at cricket um and if you're performing bad then it's almost like your whole life is kind of imploding because mm. there's no escape from it yeah and i guess in sports in in general all sports You've only really got probably a 20, 25 year shelf life maximum um, in terms of your playing career um, from when you start to when you end. I guess then, and you mentioned, um, was it Fellani that's a principal or who uh, was it sorry, that's a principal? No, um, Kirby Short. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, fair enough. There you go. Um, or deputy principal. Mm. I guess that career is another, till, takes her till she's 70 odd, till mm. the end of her professional career. Well, it's another full time career. Exactly. You can't juggle two full time careers. Yeah. We shouldn't have to, to be fair. Well, then, and then. Wait, at what point is the pay considered professional? Mm. Um, and then at what point are you telling someone on six figures who's nailing their off-field profession to go, actually, you know what, take a 60K pay cut and, and just do sport? Um, it's it's a it's a fickle thing to balance. And the other thing too that, that could come in is, um, I guess, contracts that allow flexibility. So 
whether it be someone takes a contract at half pay, which means they only have to be there for half the time, which allows them to be a school kid or allows them to work full time still if that's what they want to do. You don't want to necessarily push someone into quitting everything off the field. So like a part time contract. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's, there's all these ideas that are are being floated at the moment and we're still two and a bit years away from a a pay deal and, and who knows what that's going to, what two years of cricket looks like. Um, but then the other thing too, is all the other things that are balanced at the same time is where's the money coming from. And, um, I think to think that we're going to go from here to here isn't like a massive jump. I don't think is going to happen. I think it's going to be a progressive thing from now Ideally, we want it to be a jump. Ideally, that's what we want it to be. But um, once you look at everything else that's that's at play, you don't necessarily want to to cancel those people out, nor have to pull the money from um, another competition that that's mm. ultimately going to going to fail as a result. Mm. Well, you look at how far Australian women's crickets come. They're arguably the best Australian sports team. Period. Mm-hmm. Now. How much, well, how far has it come since, I guess, you were involved back in, you know, 2013, 2014 to where it is now? Yeah, they're full time. Um, I, I think their contracts are still there essentially only four days a week. They're only meant to be four days a week, but they train a lot more than that. Mm. Um, all of them are making a living off cricket, which is something I don't think any of us thought would even be possible, um, which is which is really cool. Um, the other thing, too, is that they're on the road eight months of the year. Um, so they're starting to, I guess, mirror the men a lot more. They're home for the domestic season, but even then some of the games, some of the domestic games for Queensland, they're not home. So, um, and all of that's dictated by the ICC and all the tournaments coming around. It seems like every year there's another World Cup or another massive series like an Ashes. So these girls are, are in a constant state of, of playing. There's not a lot of um, downtime for them. There's not a lot of off season. Um, I know this year's been massive for them at they had an Ashes series this season. And it's hard to think about that. That was mm. ages ago. They went from an Ashes series into a series against the West Indies. And then they had uh, the domestic schedule into another series. I think it was, oh, I can't remember, was Sri Lanka or something, into Big Bash. And then they had a tri-series and then the World Cup. They have mm. not stopped since May. And I guess no part of that responsibility or performing well is to inspire the next generation. Is that something you guys you know? take on your shoulders and go, you know, it's up to us to inspire the next wave of women's cricketers? It's always been a debate about whether you choose to be a role model or not. And I think as sports people, we have to be, and particularly um, as female athletes as well. Um, I think uh, Elise Villani was someone that actually mentioned a little while ago that for every girl that you look at in, in cricket and at the elite level, there's a role model for every single girl out there. And it's and it's 100% true. We're starting to get more visibility. Um, but, I, but I think it's... It's something that we've innately took on and, and I think it's something though that we enjoy because we see this as an opportunity to kick the sport forward. There's been a lot of women that went before us that we didn't know about. So mm. um, I didn't know about Belinda Clark or Catherine Fitzpatrick, these two women that are still game changers at the moment in the way that they're leading cricket and particularly Belinda Clark mm. at a, at a um, I guess, a administration level. But we didn't have the opportunity to see them. So now we've got the opportunity to make sure that more girls know that cricket is an option for them. I wouldn't be playing cricket if it wasn't for that girl at touch football. And mm. that's the scary thing. So we don't want to leave it to chance like that. We want a girl to wake up one morning and say, I want to play cricket. Well, Fox Sports, I saw it last week, announced a women's sport channel. Mm. You know, that's a big step for women's sport in this country in general. It is, and I think there's there's plenty of content out there. You only have to look at the schedules of, of what's coming up, like the, the T20 World Cups at the same time as AFLW, which then rolls into the Suncorp Super Netball. There's a women's state of origin in there, yeah. and then you start rolling into NRLW, W League, and then WBBL again, and that's not even mentioning Tokyo Olympics. So mm. it is so much happening all in the one space, and I, I think it's a great move forward. I think there's an appetite for it. There's the amount of comments at the end of last year Big Bash season that mentioned that they preferred to watch the women versus watching the men because I think um, we play T20 a lot more than the boys nowadays and I think as a result we're a bit more we're starting to become tactically better because we don't have the brute strength to just clear the front leg and just try mm. and bosh it straight. We've got to find ways to manipulate the field and also start to manipulate the bowler. And vice versa, as a bowler, we're trying to counter that. Yeah. So It's real cricket, not it just is, a hack. It yeah. is. It isn't just a hack, and yet you've still got those power hitters like your Grace Harris's that can come in at the end and, and really break open a break open a game. 
Well, let's talk about that T uh, Twenty World Cup that's going on currently. How do you think the Aussies have fared so far in the competition? I think they've um, they've had a bit of a scare, but I don't think it's too much to be worried about. I think World Cups, in my experience, have been all about momentum, similar to a big bash tournament. Really, mm. um, you are allowed to drop a game, um, and I think sometimes having those tighter matches actually fares you better than when you eventually get to the semi-finals. You're actually I guess, really quite solid in what your approach is as a team. T20 World Cups are really hard and they're going to get even more tougher because every single country is starting to play tournaments like the WBBL. Mm. We've got so much intel on all those other players, but likewise, they've played in our conditions and they know how to how to make it work. So um, the other thing too, T20 changes in a matter of balls. Mm. So it doesn't necessarily, you don't necessarily get beaten by a team. You get beaten by one person who had a day out. And so I think the Australians know that. I know that they're, they're probably, they're, I guess, the media are hyping up a lot of the pressure, but um, I, I think they're quite comfortable in, in trusting themselves. There's a lot of those girls that are due for really good scores and, and really good days. And I think that's the frightening thing for all the other teams is they haven't seen the best of Beth Mooney this, mm. this series yet. They haven't seen um, the best of Megan Shoot yet either. Mm. And so those sorts of players are not players that, um, perform poorly too many games in a row and they haven't performed poorly. They just haven't had the outrageous success that we're used to seeing. So I I, I think that in the next few games, we'll, we'll start to see them hit their straps. Well, I mean, back in 2014, you were a part of that World Cup squad and you lost your first game against New Zealand, uh, but went on to win the competition. Do you think this Australian side has the temperament to do the same? Yeah. And even last, was it last year, 2018, when mm. the, the girls played in the West Indies, yeah. they lost to India first round as well. Yeah. So it always it, it always seems to be that if you want to have a loss, you want to have it early. It's same with Big Bash. You want mm. you'd rather have something bad happen in the in the first half of the season, and then that way you can actually build some solid momentum going into finals. I think um, I, I've seen teams go into semifinals completely um, like completely winning everything and winning well. And it actually is quite interesting to see a team like that go under pressure in a semi-final when everything's on the line and they're not used to being under pressure. So I think the Aussies, as much as it's they're scrapping through, I think that's the best thing about them is that they're scrapping and that mm. they're fighting hard. Well, yeah, we've so seen that in the uh, men's Big Bash well, for the last nine seasons, the Melbourne Stars. Pretty mm-hmm. much every year they... Yeah. Sorry to mention that. Yeah. But <laughs> every year they basically come into finals and they falter because they've been so successful. So maybe it is a bit of a good omen. Yeah, maybe lose exactly. The and even even with the stars this year, they had a brilliant start. They only lost one in like the first nine or ten yeah, games, exactly. and they lost their last three going into semis. And that's what can just halt momentum. T yeah. twenty mm. is such a fickle game, and it's such a an ego and a confidence game, and it's really hard to to gain that when you're not winning at the crucial point of the tournament. Mm. And who's who's Australia's biggest threat? Do you think at this World Cup? Um, you'd have to say India. I think mm. New Zealand as well. Um, and the scary thing is, is that both of those teams are in our pool. Yeah. Um, mm. Pool of death. I think yeah, pretty much. And, mm. it, and it's always based on how the last World Cup went. Um, I think I would love to see it to be an Australian-India final. I think that would be awesome. And particularly to be at the MCG, um, they're trying to pack it out with 90,000. Isn't, Ka- isn't Katy Perry? Katy Perry, Katy Perry yeah. is there. Oh, so that is cool. You get to pay $20 and you get to see... <laughs> Katy hey, Perry perform at the MCG gig. and, some great and then cricket. also yeah. some great cricket. How so the pinnacle of, of our sport on the world stage. So That's so big for women's cricket though, isn't it? It's Packing huge. out the G. We need to make the trip down, boys. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Definitely need to. Need to. No, it's, it'll be an awesome, awesome day. But yeah, it'll be a tough, um, tough couple of games to see who actually ends up in that position. We only saw, I think last night, that the West Indies lost to Pakistan. So mm-hmm. everyone's getting a game over each other. The dark horses, I actually think, that'll make the semis will be South Africa. They've Ooh. got a team to win it. Mm, okay. But they've just got a... They're notorious for, for having those few key players and relying so often on those key players. They need some of those those players that, I guess, aren't the, the genuine threats that other teams, mm. in quotation marks, that other teams would, would only look at. Um, to start stepping up, which which they have been this tournament. So they're the smoky. They're the dark horse. They're the smoky. Yeah. They're the smoky, but um, I think it'll be an Australia-India final. Cool. Awesome. Well, we touched on it briefly. WBBL, how do you find your season this season? Yeah, it was tough for us at the Stars. Um, we, I really enjoy being down there and mm. the group is, is awesome, but 
Um, it's just one of those things sometimes that you uh, everything can be going right. You're training right and then something goes against you. Or, um, we had a, a number of games where we were in an opportunity to win and we just didn't know how to get over the line. So while it was a tough year, I think we'll fare much better for it next year. Um, I think there's a lot of players across all the teams off contract. So I actually don't know what any of the teams are going to look like next year. Bit of a carousel. Yeah, mm. that's it. I think there's five of us um, still on contract at the Stars. And I think most of the other teams are, are quite similar in that they've only got a handful that, that are on multi-year deals that are extending at the moment. Mm. So um, I don't think the, I think there's an embargo period at the moment. So no one's allowed to be signing anything, but uh. I think there'll be an absolute frenzy coming in. And, and particularly when you've got teams that have, haven't gone so well and other teams that have gone extremely well, and then something like a World Cup on home soil to look at some international players as well. I think there's going to be a lot of change. And we've got to touch so. on it. Playing in green this year or last year, mm. leaving the Brisbane heat. Now we are Brisbane boys <laughs> and girl, of course. How tough was it to leave Brisbane and, you know, I guess move down to Melbourne? Yeah, it was really tough. Um, I, I'm i such a loyal person and I love the girls at, at Queensland and, and essentially the Brisbane heat because it's pretty much one and the same. And um, for me, I actually had to sit down and have a think about where I wanted to go with my cricket. Um, at that point in time, I think I'd bowled, we'd played 14 games and I bowled 13 overs and I wasn't performing I'm always quite critical of myself and I wasn't performing bad um, but I, there was just we had too many bowlers and so for me to want to be a, a strike bowler of, of the tournament I needed to go elsewhere and um, the stars threw me a line I had another team that I was talking with I actually thought I was going to end up there but um, as soon as I sat down with Kristen Beams who was captain at the time I knew that it was a straightaway fit and I think that's a cool thing particularly even across women's sport is that I was able to connect with um, or, or chat with some other female athletes who have made moves like that to see what it is that they were after because I couldn't really articulate what it was and it wasn't until Gabby Simpson told me that you needed to find or work out what environment it is that you need to perform and it wasn't until um, Kristen Beams mentioned how much of a family they are and um, how much she backs her bowlers. She said, "If T20 is one of those games where you, you're going to get hit. Um, you can bowl well and, and your figures don't reflect that. But she's like, if you're still the best option against this batter, I'm giving you the ball. Um, and I think that confidence was felt right throughout the, the whole tournament. Mm, well, it's, it's a really stacked squad up here in Brisbane. We saw Josie Dooley leave as well, who's a friend of the show as well. Um, <laughs> But so it's a really hard team to get into. And yeah, she's obviously gone down to the Renegades, um, had a great season. Um, but yeah, let's talk about girls. Let's talk about Girls and Glory, your <laughs> podcast. How have you found it so far? Yeah, it's been awesome. Um, I've, I've only, I'm only a few episodes in, but mm. it, it's a bit of a passion project for mine. And I think it's one of those things probably similar to you guys. It's, it's been something that you've thought about and talked about for ages and, and you just need the guts to finally actually do mm. it and put it yeah. out there. Exactly. It out. Exactly. Mm. So yeah. this year is a massive year for women's sport and, um, I thought it'd be best to launch it o across the, the T20 world cup. But, um, for me, I, I've, like I said before, women's sport is so well connected. I know a lot of the athletes and the cool part with that is you meet a lot of them at, at, um, appearances and you're on the same panels as well as some of their sports administrators and everything. And you hear some of these incredible stories and quite often the only people that get to hear it, are yourself on the panel <laughs> and then the 50 to a couple hundred people that are, that are in the room. Mm. Um, and, and yet a lot of these stories are really inspiring and, and stories that need to be shared. I think that's, um, the, the point of difference that women's sport has is that you've got women that are pursuing so many careers or so many, got so many balls in the air, um, trying to, while also trying to be an elite athlete. And, um, a lot of their stories are quite different because it's not necessarily the, the cliche. I was good at it. I made an academy. Now I'm here. Mm. Um, you've got women that have changed sports. You've got administrators who are, who were given, uh, so for instance, the AFLW was yeah, thrown Richmond on, yep, as well. that's yeah. it. The AFLW as a tournament, um, was thrown on the desk of Gemma Wong. I think it was like seven weeks before launch and mm. she had to make it happen. And so I've heard people like that talk and you, you sit there and you're like, people need to know about these incredible people mm. that mm. make women's sport what it is. And, and it's, it's stuff we're not privy to as athletes either. Quite often we go out there, we play and then we come off and do recovery and you do it again the next day. Um, you're not, a, you don't actually get to see what goes into a broadcast deal, what broadcasters are trying to do to, to help women's sport grow. 
um, what some of the what sports staff do away from the game that you don't get to see either. So I'm hoping that I can bring people along the ride a little bit there and, and see not only what the athletes do and their own temperament, but also what some of these off-field game mm. changes have done to, yeah. to, to women's sport. Mm. And the Jess Jonathan stories are out, the podcasts mm. are out. Mm. What would be a pull for someone who maybe hasn't listened to it yet? Why would you say to them, listen to these ones specifically? I don't think JJ's story has been told before. Um, mm. I, I think you often hear from similar people, um, your similar marketing people. And I think um, JJ's got an interesting one where she has had a lot of um, problems in the mental side of things um, that she's come through and she's a 100% better person for it. But then she's also had a number of setbacks, both injuries and significant injuries that, that probably haven't been um, as advertised. But um, also she had um, her a bit of family ill health as well at the at a really crucial point in her career as well. So um, she's a, a ripper of a chick. And I, I remember before I interviewed her, I asked her and said, look, are you okay if I ask you about these things? And she just said to me, I'm an open book. So if you want to get to know who JJ is and what makes her tick, that's she's completely given me absolutely everything. Yeah. And you mentioned setbacks there. I hope this is okay. You've mm. had a few setbacks in your career, um, elbow injuries, other kind of injuries, other setbacks. What kind of impact has that had on your career? Uh, huge. Um, mm. I think I've, I've only just sat down with the physio this year and worked out that I think I've played eight seasons at this level and um, at least six of them I've been injured in the preseason. Wow. So I think I feel like I'm in a constant state of catch up and I'm hoping that I can finally have an off season and a preseason where I'm uninjured and that goes into a, a really good season because constantly when you're injured around preseason, all you're trying to do when they get you, when you get the all clear to bowl again, is to just get you up and ready for selection. So quite often then your variations go out the door. You're just trying to just be able to bowl in a in an okay area that that can be effective and you can set fields to. And so quite often I feel like even though I've upskilled over those years, I probably haven't to the level that I would have liked to, um, because you're constantly just trying to put one foot in front of the other and and try and avoid the next injury. I've been. Um, unfortunate with a lot of mine have been bony injuries. And as a result of that, it's four months minimum. So I, I, I haven't even done the tallies yet of how, how many months I've actually been out in my career, but, um, safe to say I'm really good at the rehab. Um, <laughs> good. I, uh, I think with the last, I had a stressy in my pelvis, which is a really weird one for a bowler. Mm. Um, and that was this season just gone and we started to do some of the core work and everything in the, phys we had a new physio and she said, oh, you're actually really good at this. I'm like... I know. Yeah, that's it. I know how to do this. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's it's frustrating, but unfortunately, as a, as a as an athlete, that's one of those things. And it, you can sit there and be bitter that there's other players that don't have the same setbacks. But I like to think that I'm a much uh, better person as a result of it. I think I've got so many more lessons in resilience and and um, I guess confidence in myself as a result of it because that's all you've got. You've got to find a way to get through it. And you've got to find a way that, um, I, I came out of, of, uh, I guess this injury went straight into WBBL and my second bowl of my long run was against the sixes. Mm. So, um, you've kind of just got to trust yourself and go, okay, what'll be is what, what will be. Mm. And was your love of the game, I guess, ever tested during rehab and that type of thing? Cause I mean, it is injury after injury. Mm. I don't think the love of the game was tested. I think I'm sitting there wondering if, the universe is trying to tell me that this is not what I'm meant to be doing. Yeah. And am I not meant to play cricket um, or be an elite athlete? I think that's a really, it's a really hard place to be. Um, but you always pull through, you always find a way. I think we just haven't yet found what works for me. And it's a really cool space to be in with what they're starting to investigate with women's sport as well. And um, how does women's health differ from men's health and also how does our bodies differ. We've already heard about a lot of the AFLW stuff with ACLs and everything. Well, they're starting to even look at does things like hormones start to affect at certain points of the month, should we be deloading people because we don't, we're, they're at, their bodies for whatever reason are at risk at that point in time. Um, there's so many differences within female athletes that we haven't, um, I, I guess, worked out yet. And Similarly, a lot of the research with stress fractures are on male fast bowlers. So we don't actually have enough research and data behind the women's stuff to go, okay, maybe girls are more hypermobile, which is why 
we start to see more and more stress reactions in the lumbar spine. So mm. it's cool. We're probably, I reckon it'll be another 15 years, but those girls coming through, the ones that we're seeing yeah. at clinics, tell you what, the, the sports science and the sports medicine area is going to be red hot by the time that they're coming in. Well, final question for you today. Is there any advice you'd give younger girls looking to play cricket in the future? Uh, and uh, you could give a lot. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think for for me, uh, I was always one that, that did the one percenters and you always do something a little bit extra. Um, mm. But I think I also had a period of, of time there where I was only chasing performing well and I was, it, often to the detriment of, of who I who I was and, and my own confidence. So I think you need to just keep enjoying it and know that um, cricket's one of those games where – you will have more bad days than good. Um, and I think the sooner that, that you realise that, the better because you actually start to enjoy some of the, the rough days as well because you know the good one's not too far away. Mm. I had Alex Blackwell tell me that in every form slump, there's always one ball or one over in your spell that's completely you and it's you at your best. And it's just a matter of putting that to Same thing with batting. You're only one innings away from, from your best again. So... Um, it's fickle and it's cruel, but I think mm. um, if you if you love the game that much, you be prepared to, to go on the ride with it. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us today, Holly. Um, if you haven't already checked out Holly's podcast, uh, go visit Girls and Glory on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere you get your podcasts. It's a really good listen. Once again, thanks, Holly. Hey, thanks, guys. Thanks, Holly. Well, thank you once again to Holly uh, for that great interview. Uh, she had a lot of great things to say about uh, women's cricket uh, and the development in that area. Uh, what did you boys think about the interview as a whole? Mm, I thought it was really interesting what she had to say about the pay um, specifically. I thought that was really cool um, and very interesting. A really different take. Obviously, we asked a similar question uh, to Emma Zilke when she came on the show. We've been trying to ask that question because it is important. Right, um, it's an important thing to the players. It's an important thing to the game and the growth of the game as and a whole. But yeah, it's also important to see just how far the, ca- the game has come and where it's going. And she's she highlighted that pretty well. And again, she's doing that in her podcast, which we'll plug again. Go give oh, it, yeah. go give it a listen. Yeah, go listen to Girls in Glory. Mm-hmm. You'll find it everywhere. It's really yeah, good. It's great. Anyway, we will be discussing a lot of brilliant topics in this tale. First off, this one's uh, been making its, this brilliant. one's been making brilliant its way. Much around the world um it's not a sport it's actually a deadly virus <laughs> my um, god it's uh that was the that was, the, was, the, that you, was terrible you, yeah. could not, you could not have introduced that any worse you know deadly disease it is making its way around the world that's how you yeah. brought it up yeah it's, that's just um, fantastic well i mean it, it, it this is not fantastic uh we're seeing plenty of sports games actually being cancelled or postponed uh, relocated well, to different areas. Let's just firstly say we hope everyone's all right. Uh, yeah. Sports the second that the sport doesn't matter when it comes to these things. We hope everyone's all right. We hope everyone's safe. Um, we hope everyone's all good. But yes, sports games are being cancelled around the world. CJ, that's yeah. the thing. Um, we look at Super Rugby. Obviously, mm. we're going to chat about that in a bit. But mm. the Brumbies were supposed to go to the Moon Dogs in a few weeks. I think mm, it yeah. was and up to Japan. That's been that's been canned. I don't uh, know if totally it's been ga- canned or it's been, been postponed. Been cancelled for the time being, so yeah, yeah postponed. postponed. Uh, Six Nations, mm-hmm. uh, Italy, Ireland, that's been yeah. postponed. Mm. Yeah. Um, Lazio, Inter yep. in the yeah. Serie A. So well, big game. A title decider. Italy. Now, well, that's now being played behind closed doors. I mean, Italy mm. especially has been... They've been uh, one of the worst in Europe yeah, it's, by far. Well, it's just created havoc, this... Uh, uh, this virus. Obviously, my um, brother Ryan, he just got back from Italy 10 days ago. Well, he was there 10 days ago. And we were planning to go over to yours after this recording. Um, he better be in quarantine. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. don't know about that. Part. No, no, no. It's um, But it's kind of whack to think that, again, if his trip was two weeks later, mm. obviously he'd be in the thick of it. So George Nickel, Sam McDonald Smith, Angus Shaw and RM. Mate, name dropping. These Ooh, huge names that? of uh, no, just, Brisbane I mean, culture. I mean, I just want to bring a smile to Katrina yeah. Shaw's face. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you, listener, so you, I mentioned, you mentioned the football. Um, up north, particularly in Italy, they're having real problems. Uh, mm. A lot of uh, people have been catching this virus up north, in, in the north of Italy. Mm. Uh, so there's been plenty of cancellations, uh, particularly uh, in the uh, Lombardi and Veneto I believe they're states in mm. it's it's up north in Italy, yeah, provinces but they're also uh, they're also yeah playing these games behind doors. So Inter Milan, they're 
uh, the second leg of their round of 32 match in the Europa League. Mm. That one's being played uh, behind closed doors. No one's allowed to attend, mm. right? Um, and it's that one's same, against uh, Ludogrets. Yeah. Do you see them rocking up to the oh, airport as well? Big match, Ludogrets. No. Yeah, Football Dude, they are um, powerhouse. So, mm. so Ludogrets, Hungary, Hungarian. Uh, I want to say. I don't think they're very hungry. Ha ha ha. Um, no, but yeah, they 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 came to the airport wearing uh, uh, face masks. Uh, mm. And it, it's it's quite a sight. Bulgarian, yeah. Bulgarian. Bulgarian. I knew it was They're one, one of the Bulgarians. <laughs> like yeah. I said before, though, Inter Milan, Lazio. Yeah, that's being played behind closed doors, and that's a title decider, mm. gents. That's one v two. No one can go see it. So I guess on one hand, you know, missed opportunity is mm. for those clubs to get the revenue they rightfully deserve. But that's mm. not their most important. But that's thing. not what's important, yeah. Gusman. Yeah. Um, I mean, what is important in the Milan fashion show? Also behind closed doors. Exactly. Mm. Mm. That's what Damn we're talking it. about. I think we need a virgin to more fashion boys. I was going to be able to see. <laughs> we <laughs> won't be able to see Jay from in between us <laughs> strutting it out <laughs> on the Milan. Yeah, I was exactly. hoping catwalk. I was hoping to feature. Oh that's why, yeah. That's why I've got my phone in front of me just because mm. you went for the call. Got up. my ears pierced. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking good. Yeah. I'm a good yeah. looking rooster. That much <laughs> oh is my true. God. I thought you said you had a face for radio, Pat. A bit of both. I I jump between the two depending on how I'm feeling. Doesn't have to just be one. I let me tell my story. All traits. Campbell. Mm. Gee whiz, mate. I mean, Ugh. The, Ugh. Ugh. the Italian sides, they're not the only ones being um, sort of impacted by this this virus. I mean, we, we saw a couple months ago, actually, um, when China w- were going to play their Olympic mm. qualifier. Yes. That got uh, moved. That was originally going to be played in Wuhan, and uh, I can understand why they moved it, because that was the, yeah, the, the centre of the epicentre. Mm. So... Then they tried to move that around China. Yeah, but do you remember where did it end up, boys? It ended up in Sydney. Yeah, but um, do you remember the um was it the Chinese football team? They were held in quarantine exactly, in, their, yeah. in their hotel yeah. in Brisbane. Well, so university. The, sorry, go continue. Thank you. I mean, I'm midway through a sentence. No, sorry, go. Okay, how no. rude of you, Campbell. Oh, no, sorry, no, no, no. We're just we're just bantering, guys. Mm. It's fine. Uh, no, but they had to like train and like do their like preps and stuff in the hallway <laughs> in a conference yeah. room seriously this is <laughs> yeah. true there was like clips and like photos of it of it's hilarious getting them like stretching in the yeah. hallway <laughs> as a team team oh bonding but it's like it must have been so hard for those girls and obviously all the athletes who are affected at the moment it's yeah. uh it's not a uh, not groovy time well, they still went out and thumped uh thailand 5-0 and yeah. drew with australia having not trained pretty much at all keep in mind that week that aussie Result was a 94th minute equaliser. Exactly. So yeah. they should have got the chocolates, but they couldn't quite get it. Mm. Anyway. Well, University of Queensland students are being essentially held in quarantine in Thailand. Really? Chinese students, yeah. They, they had to fly to Thailand first, and they're like waiting on approval to come over to Australia. Yeah. To I stop mean, you, showing you, signs. you're hearing stories about this like all the time. I mean, there was that cruise that people were stuck on where they couldn't leave. That. Mm. I mean, I've been on a cruise for five days and I was like, get me off this thing. I can't imagine. Well, I wouldn't if- <laughs> want to spend one day on them. Uh, I couldn't imagine. Cruises ima- are, I've said this before on the podcast. I've said this before in my entire life. I'm, I'm a big advocate. Well, I'm not an advocate. I'm an advocate of no <laughs> an anti-advocate. anti-advocate of cruises. cruises. Yeah. See, I'm the opposite. I know. You're I a like fan. I like a cruise. I do. Uh, you I like do. a bit of shuffleboard. I'm yeah. not a fan. I, I, I'm just saying, like, I, it would have been torture for these people to stay on this cruise for more I, than I think there's I mean, worse things yeah. than being on a cruise they're, oh, they're not getting waterboarded here right? Exactly. yeah I um, guess but still like I cruises said, are not breaking bad. any Geneva conventions yeah, pretty we bad. hope not CJ. let's hope not Who knows? Uh, another game that was cancelled as I said before or postponed for the time being is Ireland Italy and the Six Nations mm. now Sergio Parisi mm. um, he was going to retire at the end of the Rugby World Cup the legend. I- Italy legend mm. and he unretired because his final game or what was going to be his final game against New Zealand was cancelled because of Typhoon Hadjibus. Mm. Right? And now he's trying to retire. <laughs> he, he's made himself available for selection mm. for one game in the Six Nations. So. And that's against, just a second, that's mm. against England and Rome. Right? Mm. But if that's cancelled, <laughs> does he just. Unretire again. <laughs> exactly. Does he just keep going? So, Maybe he'll go for another 10 years. Go, I'm going to retire. Oh, wait, it's cancelled. I've got to unretire okay, again. So what you're saying is the Italian government and the Italian Rugby Association is the cause of all natural disasters. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, <laughs> yes, Campbell, I am. And diseases. Okay, <laughs> yes. just good, just to know. It, it, they want to keep him playing. <laughs> they want to keep him playing. playing. <laughs> typhoon, all right. Yeah, okay, <laughs> deadly disease. Well, we have to have an epidemic to stop you. <laughs> Bloody hell, man. Thank, thank God we have this platform so I can share this news. But, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Again, how long will this last for? Because the bloke's going to keep going, hey, I 
Got to play my final game. <laughs> my legs I got to end off. eventually, guys. Like, exactly. come on. So I think it's going to another get, typhoon. <laughs> it's going to get to the stage now where I think he's just going to unretire again, Gusman. Yeah. And wait till the November internationals when either Aussie, New Zealand, or South Africa go up there and go, oh, hey, really? does, we're here now. Mm. Does it does time he, to retire? But time to have an earthquake. And then Ooh, World War can't, Three can't, is on. <laughs> can't he just retire without playing that last game? To nah, be, th- this we'll guy, this guy is a legend. Yeah. Um, trust me, I've spoken to him. Um, anyway, <laughs> oh, um, sorry. oh, okay. No, 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 no. Um, he deserves that. I think he deserves okay. to bow out with the match. Yeah, mm. and it's not fair in a way that. You know, weather's impacting that, but at the same time, mate, your time's up. Yeah. You know, you've got to move on and let the, you know, let the next guy come in and yeah. have his go. 100%. Well, one team that's on the ascension while we're on rugby, the Queensland Reds, boys. Oh, how about that? How good. What a victory. The Moondogs, yeah. Sunwolves. It'll Take help. It. I still think they could have scored another 20. Yeah. The yeah. Sundogs were Sundogs. Sunwolves. You're I'm getting the two confused. The two. Exactly. Yeah. They're getting absolute. They got railed in that game, quite frankly. They do. It's quite disappointing, but I think it's worrying signs for the Rebels. Mm. As weird as that sounds. Because who lost? Who lost to the, the, the Moondogs yeah. in Fukuoka? I can't wait to play ago. Was it the Moondogs? Mm. Sunwolves. Yeah, okay. yeah Sunwolves. Yeah. They're the only yeah. team playing in Fukuoka. Okay, I've, been, I've been saying... Good city. Uh, mm. I've been saying Moon Dogs for about three weeks now. So mm. if we're not caught, yeah, yeah, we're not on board yeah. with that, then I'm going to yeah. have to revoke it. But anyway, I mean, I just never heard it before. Yeah, I've never heard anyone saying. use it. Again, that's you. that's the rugby circles, gents. So I've mm. I've heard it a lot. I'd like to say I created it because let's face it, I try to be the funny guy and the funny guy most try of the time. Is the most important yeah. word there. Um, yeah, is yeah. what it is. Yeah, I mean, people don't even say try. <laughs> I don't know. He tries his best. Okay. Yeah. Let's just leave it at that. Exactly. No, but great game. Jock Campbell played. an Excellent game, I thought. Six tri- uh, six conversions. Six, six conversions. would have been even yeah. better. But six conversions yeah. is pretty good in exactly. itself. A couple of line breaks. Yeah. Very, very good game. Mate, it's a good team performance. It's uh, the coming of age, in a way, for mm. Queensland Reds. Mm. But this is a team, the Moondogs, who are on their way out. Mm. You know, if reports are, well, remember it was announced last year that they are going to leave Super Rugby mm. at the end of this year, which I find weird because do it, yeah. at the end, do it at the end of the World Cup cycle. That makes sense. Yeah. But again, end of this year, they're going to go. Their team's already pretty depleted. I don't think they played a preseason match against a Super Rugby team. Like this is a team is very much on the ropes. So, can you really grade yourself against them? Yeah. No. No. They have the Sharks in Suncorp at Suncorp again this, this week, weekend. and then they're off to Christchurch to play the Saders, the three-time champs. Yeah. So I mean, that'll be the good, tough. The good thing with the Reds is they have been testing this whole season. Yeah, these first three I rounds, think, they probably should have had. It it could easily be four and zero yeah. to start the season. But it could it could very easily be four and zero. Th- but it's a, sh- it's a shame for Brad Thorne's man that uh, that rugby's an eighty minute game. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're right. I also think James O'Connor's fit nicely into the number ten jersey. Very so nicely. far. Um, we'll see how he goes against some better oppositions mm. because the Sun Wolves, I mean, like you guys said, they're not really a challenge. Um, we'll Echo, see how. Uh, well, I'm just restating the fact. We'll we'll see how they go against uh, some of the New Zealand sides. Um, I mean, the the Reds uh, have a luxury of playing a few more home games now because I mean mm. they started off. But that's how the it works. year. Yeah, yeah, I know they started off the year playing three away games. So, uh, hopefully, they can get some wins make at it. home at SunCorp in front of the faithful. Mm, make it a fortress. Uh, good for Josh Nasser as well on debut, getting a uh, try, I believe, on a meat, debut. A meat pie, yeah, 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 yeah. Good and, on him. And then, well, I mean. The Pretoria Sharks are the biggest test. Pretoria Sharks? Are they Pretoria? Where are they from? I don't know. Anyway, Durban. Sharks. Durban. Are they Durban? Yeah. Which is the Pretoria team? Bulls. Bulls. Anyway, uh, I should know that. But. Fake fan. Fake <laughs> fan. Oh, yeah. I don't claim to be a South African <laughs> team fan. You did after the final. Oh, I'm national so, team, I am. But in terms of okay. domestically, Sorry. not a fan. Khaleesi, I'm not going to support you during the Super Rugby season. But no. as soon as you don that green jersey, mate, I'm all yours. That's You're my exactly man. exactly right, mate. Um, Don't worry. You can uh, join a rugby league uh, side. No or... chance, pal. Did you, pl- pledge, did, pledge you, your, uh, did you just go for a high five there? And he yeah. just did pledge, it pledge your loyalty oh, to, a, to a rugby uh, league side. Uh, uh, Yuck. Do, do it once, it's an accident, Gusman. Do it twice. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? You're I'm making scared. an error. No, but this game is going to be the biggest test recently as high they're five. very... Um, no, I did not high-five, just for the record. Let the record show it. Did not high-five, Gus. Okay, I high five um, myself. Fine. Yeah. That's even worse than getting rejected. Yeah, that is dreadful. Self-five. No. Yeah. No, but this is the big test for them coming up, I think. Yeah. Uh, they're 4-0. Oh. Yeah. Or three wins from four. So. Yeah, they're on very hot form, so it'll be good to see what they... 
what they get up to at Suncorp, at Lang Park. Lang Park. Well, let's talk about the other Australian team who I guess is succeeding at the moment. Last mm. weekend, the trend, gents, mm. finally broken. For the first time since 2007, the Brumbies got the chocolates against the New Zealand team in New Zealand. And this snapped Australians' uh, 0-7 start against foreign opposition to the 2020 Super Rugby mm. season. Mm. Gusman, mm. mate, the Brumbies, surely, the home team, is gonna, the Brumbies. You, as, mate. as a Canberra boy through and through, Raiders fan and all that, no, yeah, got to bring a, got to bring a smile to your face. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm happy for him. Uh, it's not as though I was, I'm like jumping up and down. I'm not ecstatic. You're a fake Canberra. You don't deserve to be born there, mate. What do you mean? Does anyone? No, nah. I wouldn't Canberra, wish it upon my Canberra's worst enemy, not, if I'm honest. <laughs> Canberra is not the ideal climate to be living in. It is. Oh, it's there's, all right. there's a, uh, have you ever lived in Canberra? I've lived in Tumut, which is just down the road. So, okay. Yes. I've lived in uh, Brisbane. Where, no, a lot. Graceville. Um, I've lived in Graceville. It's, very, it's a very graceful what, area. What, what, <laughs> don't say my area. What, yeah, what's, what's worse? Your dogs. Ooh, what's yeah. worse, living in Canberra or living on the south side? South side. Yeah. Technically, Canberra is the south side, so... Yeah, kind of. It's far south, isn't it? Mm. Anyway, yeah, well, is I was it south, or is it more like south central, almost S- central south? Mm. I mean, it's because the capital. It's so. not. Yeah, it but is technically the central. It's a paddock. So I guess you're north of something. We'll give you that. So I'm not <laughs> north side. We're on north side. Ah, oh, don't start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't start. Anyway, hello, hello, my fellow northsiders. How are we doing? <laughs> oh, we? Well, he we're all Brisbanielanders, so he actually looks fine. civilized. What the hell? Um, yeah, no, I was really, uh, I'm yeah, su- really I'm pleased. Suddenly that miss- sh- I'm suddenly missing three teeth. <laughs> yeah, other way around. You've gained three teeth. I was, uh, uh, I, was <laughs> I was very pleased that an Australian side could break this duck because it's it's been a long time coming. Thirteen years. Um, defeating the Chiefs. Um, How about them Chiefs? Chiefs mana. Yeah, so it's good things for the Brumbies. Uh, they're probably they're, they're, well, they're definitely Australia's best side. So let's see that. What am I? What, what am I even saying? They're I not going to no go idea. all the way. You are okay. talking they're, out of your. They're rear not going to go pal. all the way. I'll take over from you, mate. They are Australia's best team at the moment, but again, it's early doors, gents. It's early mm. days. It's only I want to say what five rounds in, four rounds in now. Mm. So. Again, you can't really consider anyone as a title contender. No, not no. yet. Because even, you know, the Saders and the Chiefs who are, actually, to be fair, the Chiefs, they were arguably the benchmark going into the match against the Brumbies. Mm. Yeah. If there were going to be power rankings, they would have been first. Yeah. So the Brumbies to do that away from home. It's pretty know, big. May, maybe they could go all I the mean, way. they're definitely Australia's best chance. So to mm. be to be fair. If See you, how the Reds go, but yeah. Uh, I don't think so. the Reds can compare to the Brumbies at the moment. They yeah. need a couple of years. Who knows? They were very close against them recently. I think the Reds are building. Round one. I think that's their thing. Yeah. They might not get to finals this year, but they could end the season as Australia's best team on form. Yeah. Not necessarily on the ladder. Yeah. But I think early tip, uh, Storm is to go all the way. Yeah, since I, since yeah, you brought I it up. Well, yeah. I saw a stat. I can't remember. I read it on Fox Sports that said the Queensland Reds are the most cohesive side in Australian rugby. Um, there was a metric they had What's for the stat in terms of well, no, in, in just in terms of the amount of players that come through the academy yep. and stuff. They're the highest turnover, well, li- lowest turnover rate in terms of academy prospects and stuff like that. So it's very good in terms of that uh, regard because you know well, it's it's close net CJ. And exactly, that goes a long way for the players who want to play for the jersey mm. rather than play for their careers. Exactly, you know it goes both ways, and maybe for success, that's what it has to be like. Yeah, one hundred percent. So it's going to bode well for them in the future. We hope so. The Queensland faithful, exactly. Mm. Hopefully, well, not hopefully because I'm a Canes fan, but let's maybe see some future. Well. In the future, let's see some uh, replays of 2011, I guess. Let's or, do it. And, yeah. I mean, Fraser McWright got a run out this weekend. Yeah, I think his first of the season, He's so that's good to see. Named again this week. Yeah. On, on the bench. Good stuff. Two, cha- two uh, changes to the starting 15. Mm. Yeah. Couldn't tell you who they were. I just know that. So move no. on quickly. Fair okay. enough. <laughs> anyway, I think we'll wrap up for today. Uh, we had a great time interviewing uh, Holly Furling. She had plenty of amazing things to say about women's cricket. Uh, go give it another listen because it was one of the best interviews I reckon we've done. Uh, if you want to check us out on social media, you can do so at uh, Instagram at, at underscore beyond the sidelines underscore got there. Facebook. Yeah, mm. I got there mm-hmm. at beyond the sidelines. Uh, check us out on YouTube as well. I mean, if you're one of, one of those people who listens to podcasts on YouTube, uh, you can do that. But uh, mainly uh, check us out on Spotify and uh, Apple podcast. Do it. Uh, anything else you boys want to add before no. we sign off? I'm just fanging a pizza and a fro I'm coat. so hungry. I'm, I'm starving. Yeah. I've been in the studio for 10 hours. Exactly. Yeah. But so, again, 
Thank you very much to Holly Furling. Yeah. Go check out her podcast, Girls and Glory. Yeah. No, go check it out. Po- yeah. More of our podcast. More, more our podcast, but hers as well. Tell your friends. You can listen to both of them. At the same time. Yeah. yeah. Listen to one on Apple Podcasts, one on Spotify. Now, that is multitasking. Exactly. Now, they're obliged now. I'm going to say it's a disclaimer now. If you're still listening, you have to tell two friends. That's you the rule. You're this legally, is the rule. It's, I, <laughs> you're legally binding. You're legal, this, this is, is legally contract. binding. This is a contract. This I, is a verbal contract. Exactly. We, yeah. Do you definitely. accept the contract? Silence so, if you say yes. Sign below. Blink if you say yes. Yeah. Got you. Great. Anyway, we'll, you. We'll, we'll catch you next time, guys. <laughs> <laughs>